All right. We actually still waiting for Ron to appear, but meantime, any volunteers to take minutes? Please. Uh, come on. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. So, I don't know if we shall wait for Ron. I was going to say it's going to be a very short meeting, but I know it's famous last words. We should make the next person who joins be the meeting taker. Yes, taken. I was thinking about that. <laughs> yes, it's actually a good idea. But we need uh, this should be automated feature of Meteco, right? You press the button, and whoever joins next uh, should be uh, uh, automatically assigned as a meeting minutes taken. Thanks, Florence. Appreciate it. I hopefully it's not going to be too much of a job today. And everyone who says something at the microphone could later take a look and update the minutes. Thank you very much. So I don't know. Probably I don't know if Ron is missed in action. Okay, let's let's start with housekeeping anyway. So welcome, operational security capabilities for IP network infrastructure. Is it the longest working group name at ITF? OPSEC for short. Uh, note well, I think everyone has seen it before many times this week, but just in case, if you have not, please, Take a look. I decided not to put the slide about uh, Meteco. I mean, with all these links to Meteco and so on, because I guess if you're hearing me now, you already know how to join this session. However, housekeeping. I would appreciate if you keep your audio and video off unless you actually speak and you either presenting or join the queue. And to join the queue, you press this raise the hand button, wait for your turn, then you start sending audio and video if you prefer. And after you done with your comment, please leave the queue. Uh, yes, Florence, I'm looking at the chat. Yes, it's a note taking tool at the top right, yes. Just use this. So we have this shiny feature of preload, using preloaded slides. So Oli, let me know if you don't want to use it, but otherwise I assume we can use this. Uh, Florence already volunteered. Thanks very much for take minutes. But if you say anything today, Please uh, take a look at the meeting minutes after the session to make sure everything be captured accurate. We haven't been meeting for a while, and today we have a quite a short agenda. We have one presentation. Actually, sorry, this slide is not accurate. It's not Kirsty uh, who will be presenting. It will be Oli. And working group business. Yes, as I said, we haven't been meeting for a while. So we have not published anything. However, two drafts, which been in, as a working group business for a long time, finally seem to make a significant progress. Operational security considerations for IPv6 networks are currently with RFC editors queue, already has RFC number and so on. So stay tuned for it being published. And 
IPv6 extension headers filtering and transit routing is currently going through ISG evaluation, and I can see a lot of area directors' comments on uh, the draft. So hopefully we can finally publish this one as well. So I think it's all I have for today. Any last minute agenda bashing? Anyone has anything to present suddenly? We have time. No one. Good. So, Oli, the floor is yours. Uh, would you like to use pre-shared slides? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. So, so yeah, then you can yeah, uh, send a request. Click on the... Uh, I should stop sharing. And you... Yeah. Okay. Sorry, my bad. Okay. We will get there, I'm sure. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on the planet. Isn't this amazing? So um, thank you very much. My name is Ollie Whitehouse, and I'm the group CTO at NCC Group, and I'm one of the uh, co-authors on, on this proposal um, with Kirsty around indicators of compromise. And, and we wanted the opportunity today to kind of rewind and, and, and kind of give you an overview of, of the process that we've been on, um, the purpose, the intent, and then ask a couple of questions as we get towards the, um, the end of the presentation in terms of um, what next steps might be. So a bit of history. So um, it was originally uh, presented back in uh, uh, SEC Dispatch, uh, IETF 109. Um, we've now been through several rounds of iterations, taking on feedback at each stage, and actually the authors also have similarly increased. So we've added uh, in, in the last iteration another co-author um, um, in the guise of James, uh, and we brought it to um, the OPTEC mailing list for, for discussion, and, and thank you to Nancy and Fernando um, for, for they, were, they did a thorough review, shall we say, in zero two, and, and that led to a lot of good discussion and, and further building out um, actually of, of the work itself. Um, so really, you know, the purpose of the, the, the motivation is, and, and, and where Kirsty and I come from, you know, we're defending networks on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And it is obviously a very challenging and ever scaling set of problems that we face there, uh, both because obviously, you know, technology is changing very rapidly, um, use of maturity, you know, system admin capability, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of driving factors which complicate um, the art of cyber defense more broadly. And so we wanted to uh, provide a piece of baseline knowledge to protocol engineers specifically um, as to you know, things to consider when, from a cyber defense perspective, when designing some protocols. Um, and and that we felt that was important because you know I think increasingly uh, when we design network protocols we have a set of design choices that we that we can enact as part of that process and I think you know we see at times that some of those go against um, some of the opportunities there are to make our own jobs easier in in the provision of cyber defence and, and network defence specifically. Um, and, and so what we also wanted to do was bring kind of some of the practitioner from our side, and, and we're obviously a synthesis of, of a lot of, of knowledge, both within the UK and broader, um, in, into the ITF and, and, and really try and, as I said, kind of um, articulate the, the need and the want. So the, kind of the draft introduction really outlines that in order to get a scaling effect in our, in our cyber defense at, uh, activities, we rely on what we call indicators of compromise and and these are often um you know ip addresses dns names etc cetera, etc cetera, which can be easily transmitted and shared within various trust forums in order to detect and potentially disrupt uh, threat actor activity at relatively low cost um there obviously come with that, you know, and, and you'll see in one of the latter slides, um, what we consider the, what we call a pyramid of pain. There, there are varying degrees of, um, I guess, quality, length of time that they have efficacy for, et cetera, et cetera, but they are all important. And they have, uh, at the very least, a, 
an aggregative effect on, on combined network defense when we roll them out. So to give you examples, you know, we have systems that, that pump them out real time to, you know, hundreds of networks, you know, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of endpoints. And, and that allows us to very quickly turn on a dime in terms of when we come across new threat actor infrastructure, or we, we, we gain intelligence through um, instant response to effectively light up where that threat actor also is, and more importantly, disrupt them and eradicate them from those networks by organizations that would not necessarily be able to do so easily. They cannot procure um, certain services and the like. Uh, but you know what we wanted to do and what we've done is we've written um, you know, quite a lengthy piece of work now in terms of the role and the importance of IOCs in network defense, um, how to think about them, um, some of the design considerations, uh, how they're effective and, and, and some work to case examples. So um, this kind of gives you the kind of shows you the I guess the journey that we've been on. So on the left hand side was our was our first stab, as it were, uh, at this. And then, you know, based on the feedback and and you know the questions that we got in and and, and I can say, you know, very constructive criticism and helpful criticism uh, and, and contributions, you know, where we've kind of fleshed out uh, more so the work now to kind of provide a more standalone piece of work. So I think you know we fell into the trap that I suspect we all do at times where we assumed a base level of knowledge and we fell into our own vernacular and we didn't do enough of the base explanations and, and, and we've kind of gone through that process now um, as part of this work. So um, as, as I've touched on, you know, IOC, IOCs come in various forms. And, and so obviously at one end we have IP addresses, you know, V4, V6 addresses, but granted actors can change those, but you know, that is still, um, uh, used by by an awful lot, you know, the number of threat actors that will stand up their command and control infrastructure on a on a rented colo box in somewhere in the globe, and they'll use that for a particular campaign or operation. And so, all the malware will be hard coded to that IP address. is is surprisingly um, common still, even in 2021. Obviously, we had we have DNS domain names, and 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 people and threat actors again will similarly use that in order to masquerade or otherwise blend in with what would look like legitimate network traffic using a variety of different techniques uh, but, but you know suffice to say again you know it's a very useful tool for us to either look historically or, or in terms of active traffic flows in terms of identifying um, compromises that may be present in an environment um, obviously sni on tls um, so the server name indication so even when we can't do traffic introspection because of because of crypt, well, SNI, uh, you know, is, is a very useful tool to still, still to allow us to understand. Even though we can't see the content, the metadata allows us to understand that, that, that again there was communication to a known suspected malicious host. Code signing certificates of binaries, TLS certificate information, again, all very useful. Actors fall into the same traps. You, you know, that there's a certain laziness with their operational security. They, they they kind of get into kind of muscle memory territory. You know, they'll reuse things where they're hard to procure. Um, and and so, for example, we see campaigns as we've had to introduce code signing more more aggressively on operating systems. For example, threat actors have found ways to uh, buy uh, either masqueraded or stolen code signing certificates. Um, but then the, 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 the supply of those is quite finite, so they'll use it potentially uh, across multiple campaigns. Um, but cryptographic hashes, so of files, of other artifacts, um, so be it MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, et cetera. And then we start getting down into kind of the, the more nitty gritty. So, you know, particular tools um, and, and, bit, and bits of tradecraft and then real uh, attack techniques. And so when we put that all together, what we get is we get our, our, it's our, our pyramid of pain. Um, and uh, the, the ones at the top are um, the uh, less fragile, most precise, harder to change. The bottom ones are the most transient is, is where we get. Sorry, Olya. Yes. Sorry, Olya. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, do you want, we have uh, Eric and Q. Do you want to take questions or comments? Oh, please. Now? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I, I, should, I should have been yeah. uh, quite happy to take questions um, as, as we go. So, Eric, please, please fire up. Please go away. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your threat model for SNI? Um, so, um, as I think I mentioned on other, other locations, um, if the attacker controls the server, then SNI can't be, is, 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 is unverifiable. 
if the attacker controls the server and the client yes the uh, if the attacker controls the, sorry if the attacker controls the server the client and server pair then sni is useless uh, yes but often um to give you an example what we may see is um uh tra so where where we, why we need sni okay so they will often use content delivery networks so we will see a connection going out to something like cloudflare and uh, or you know uh, Azure CDN Edge, etc., uh, etc., et and so the IP address is responsible for potentially many, many tens of thousands of particular hosts, and so we have no idea actually where the connection is going to, but obviously through SNI in, in, inspection we can actually see that they're going to that one host that we're actually interested or or that one domain that they're actually interested in. So that that so we don't really necessarily have a threat model for. For SNI, and I think you know, I think you would recognise all of these. You have a sufficiently advanced threat actor. They can probably come up. You know, we see domain fronting being used, and other. So domain fronting is where a yeah. threat actor can effectively tunnel through. Um, that they can make us go blind. But that's the one percent. <laughs> you know, a lot sure. of this stuff is is to allow us to reduce the cost and increase the efficacy against the ninety nine percent. Sure. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Eric? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. So um, we end up with a pyramid of pain, as I said, you know, so invest heavily in the top and we get really precise, very low fragility in terms of our the techniques, tactics and procedures, which we, you know, helpfully convert to TTPs. At the bottom end, we have things which are arguably um, easy to change, commodity things, so changing a file hash, you know, getting disposable IP addresses now in 2021 is, is not particularly difficult. Similarly, acquiring um, DNS uh, domain names and, uh, and, and the like. So um, we've added a piece of work to this last release, um, specifically around the life cycle of IOCs, because we felt it actually useful to explain to, um, to everyone you know how how does it work in practice and so obviously we go through this we go through a discovery phase where we find what we think is a suspected indicator of compromise that will then be assessed and then we'll do some form of sharing so we'll do distribution of that we often use things like the traffic light protocol where that can be shared within certain trust groups for certain utility because again you know the fragility of some of these iocs means we don't want the actors necessarily always to know that that we have them because we're using it to at least combat some of their intrusions um and then that will lead to some degree of deployment that then results in ultimately detection of what were those latent compromises or attempts at compromise within those environments and then we end up with a reaction which is often a kind of a cyber defense response to either neutralizing the threat blocking the threat or or, or. And, and often then what we'll see is the the kind of the those irc iocs would degrade in terms of their value and and then are effectively end of life because again i think what you would recognize is um domains change ownership ip addresses change ownership and, and so there, there there is kind of there is a certain finite length as to their their their, their use and, and utility so um i think you know the questions and, and the next steps we have for you and, and obviously i'll quite happily take any further questions that you might have but you know we obviously would, would deeply value further feedback and comments from from this group because i think you know the 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 what we've had so far has been extremely useful um i, I think you know we do have a question is is the work that we're, that we have been doing done we've been doing even um in scope for for opsec specifically uh, and then would you consider um, uh, working group adoption? And, and I think, you know, that, that, that comes to the end of my slides and I hope you've not missed anything in the chat. Um, but do let me know if there are any other questions or the like. And, and uh, uh, sorry, Eric, do you have another question? Would you have a question, Eric, sorry? I've got two Eric's now. So Eric V, Eric V. Yeah. There, there we go. Yeah, sorry about it. Uh, I haven't read the draft, right? But what you just said, said looks like a very attractive draft, but it's more on the protocol design, isn't it, than really on operation? Uh, yes, I think that's a very fair. Well, yes, that's right. So you know what what we're asking for here is as as we design as the ICF designs. 
next generation protocols or amends existing that these be taken into consideration um because i think you're right you know the the intrinsic properties of the protocols will either preclude or not preclude the the use um or, or, or the utility of iocs yes okay Uh, oh. uh, we're going to what are you thinking? Think again. It's actually a question. Responsible for, idea. Question for Eric: Was your was that question sort of a slightly pointed? That doesn't sound like operations, and so it shouldn't be done here. Or was that for something else? You're right. I mean, I'm I'm just wondering, right? So okay. It, I was pointing in this direction, uh, but we can be open, right? Op OPSEC is pretty much open, it should be open. Uh, Eric? I, I guess, I like, uh, you know, I'm sure, it's, like, in terms of protocols, I guess, like, I think informationally, like, this is all fine. But I mean, like, you know, we now have about, we had about three separate documents that are all, like, every time you encrypt something, it makes our lives harder. And, like, you know, um, like, like it's kind of like a source of frustration, I think, um, but, um, uh, uh, between uh, sort of different parts of the IDF. So I guess, like you know, like what outcome are you hoping for here? Well, uh, what? Well, uh, yeah, and, and I think that's right. So I think we're asking you for optionality, if I'm being honest. So I think if if I look in, if I look into the world and I look at total privacy um, for everyone with, uh, and I run an enterprise, I make my job very difficult. Uh, yeah, and so I think it is. It's not asking for don't encrypt stuff. It is allowing the uh, protocol design to be have a consideration that there will have to be a systems administrator that does have to operate and secure that environment and provide some means of optionality to allow them to effectively to to do that. And yeah, and and I and there has to be naturally trade offs in that. And I think you know if you look at the do debates or dots or any of those things we see some of that today right which is when you deploy that in a corporate enterprise environment people are needing the ability to not allow doe to be deployed in certain browsers because otherwise they you know they cannot be compliant against some of their the kind of the, the kind of the sectoral specific stuff and they can't effectively defend because you know, a whole whole host of threats. And you know, and some would say, well, you just go to the endpoint and you start putting extra software on the endpoint to do that monitoring. And that's all well and good as we've got commodity operating systems where we can do that. But you know, I think we'll all of those around this table will recognize we have devices now that exist in wall gardens where we can't run code low, low enough to get the insight and the telemetry that we need. And similarly, if we look at, you know, predictions and let alone what we're living today in terms of the explosion of embedded devices, which, you know, you know, be damned if we can get third party code on there. Yet we are tasked with securing it all, monitoring it all, and detecting latent breaches. And so uh, yeah, Eric, succinctly optionality in, in some of the security properties. I guess I don't quite understand what optionality you mean in this case. So I mean like what's okay. take so, so you know so if we take a uh, those example is a bad example, but it's an example nevertheless, which is sure. um, so I guess the, the, the how how would you at the moment we have to turn DOE off, right? Or organizations have to turn DOE off if they want to do certain things with DNS uh, over certain challenges. But there probably is there is probably uh, um, smart people to me. I don't know the answer because I'm making up off off the cuff. There were, there were probably a way of building in um, a, a way to at least do uh, privacy preserving in, inspection. And I think actually we talk about it in the draft, right? So there are now ways, there are ways to do privacy preserving introspection in some ways without kind of knowing which websites I'm going to, but I can check for the presence of what, I, what I'm looking for. And, and and it's building some of that in some of so, some of some of that in, in into the future design. Well, I guess I'm pretty familiar with the cryptographic literature, and I, I don't like I'm not aware of how to do that in any kind of reasonable way. Um, um, I mean, to be honest, um, I, I guess you know, I guess what I'm trying to avoid is like we spent like literally years arguing about like how DOE to be deployed and about people who wanted like various kinds of strong statements, and we ended up ended up with was a working group which is designed to do mechanism and not policy 
And so, like, so like it'd be very unfortunate if what happened was that those discussions basically turned into like you know got basically the, 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 the attempts to create policy got diverted into this working group and then we get like most of the way ITF lost call and it's a huge food fight right so like I really don't want to do that and like and I don't think you want like everybody from TLS and Quick to show up here and start complaining at this draft so um yes. so like I'm not saying this draft is bad but I'm saying like oh, we understand what the outcome is because the outcome is to be like is the recommendation to protocols be designed in ways different than we than we are currently trying to design them? Then that is not going to be a neutral discussion. Okay, and I think that's a fair challenge. And and yeah, I, if you've not read the draft, please do. And because this is the type of feedback, and and we've gone at length. So multi party multi party computation and similar are some of the technique cryptographic techniques which allow one to um, gain. You know, some degree of, uh, of, of, of insured privacy. Yeah, I can still search for for what I want. So yeah, um, yeah. I, 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 so I, I sense the tension, and and I, I'm not sure I can. Uh, so I, I would ask you please to to look at the draft and see what we've tried to write, and see if it addresses your concerns, and if it doesn't, provide the feedback and. And sure. we'll take it on, I mean, I've read earlier versions of this. So I, I I just didn't read this this O3. But I guess like I guess I would say like I'm quite familiar with MPC and like like it's, sure. it's not a solution to this problem. Like it's basically okay. like you would need you would need radical changes to like every cryptographic protocol we now have developed in order to provide the functionality you're trying to provide. So sure. I, I just don't think that's like a plausible answer. Um, so I'm sensing that you, you feel that this is to use the best phrase a dead duck um, because there's no way that we can achieve it. Um, I guess I don't understand. Like, I mean, I think, like, uh, I guess it depends what, what this is. But if, like, what you're trying to do is, like, have a thing that would be, say, for instance, where um, where I could prove that my, my Dove resolutions were not resolving any domain name you do not like, um, that would be, like, a radical change to every cryptographic protocol you've ever designed. So, like, I mean, like, I mean, that would be, like, a multi-year research project. It would not be a, it would not be a drop-in. Um, I'm not sure it's even possible, by the way, but it's like certainly be very, very difficult. Um, so, um, so I, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess I don't, I, I think that like there's a pretty stark trade-offs to be made here between like what, um, you know, what's available to the monitoring pieces of the network and what's available, and, and in terms of light and what's not. Um, and you know, I think most of what we focused on, I think, is like you know, trying to enable people control the endpoints to disable those things, um, as opposed to um, you know, disable disable the things that are making their lives difficult. But I think that the I think that the idea that it's going to be the case that like there's some protocol we could design that would provide strong privacy against network against people on the network, but then would then would also allow people other people on the network to to be able to like see that you weren't going to certain like sites. I just don't see I don't see how that's going to work. Okay. But uh, I'll focus on comments on the draft. Like I guess you know I guess if people want to spend a lot of time like writing a draft that's sort of like another draft that is like. And Christian made us sad, like, okay, but like, if it's going to turn into like a, you know, if, if, if the outcome is going to be recommendations or protocol design, that seems like it's going to be very, very difficult to get consensus on. Yeah, and I don't think that's our intent. I, I think, you know, our intent, again, is, you know, I don't think we, we are, um, I don't think we're saying the encryption has made us bad because, you know, we, we're still not encrypting IP addresses, right? So we have tools, right? But we want, we want the community to at least be aware of the plight and to provide a, at least a reference body of knowledge. But, you know, and I think that that's the aspiration in the short term. Sure. Okay. Well, I I I don't think this is very harmful. I'll send some comments. Okay. So no one else in the queue. So what I suggest looks like there is some interest, and it looks like useful work, right? So I would really like to see more comments on the list about the draft and we'll figure out the best place for this work because uh, as a chair, I don't mind hosting it. We just need to make sure we basically, there is no better place for it, right? So if we don't find, if we, if we don't find a better place, uh, we'll run adoption call here. Okay. Well, well, well thank, you, thank you, thank you for making time um, for me, and, and thank you. Yeah. So, uh, please, everyone, if you have time, if you're interested, please read the draft, because uh, I'd like to make it clear: I really don't like the situation when drafts are getting adopted because nobody said anything on the list, and it was just quiet for the whole adoption call. 
I don't think it's uh, usually a good reason to adopt a document. So uh, I would love to see feedback on the draft and then we'll uh, go on from there. Thank you all for presenting. Any okay. last minute business? No? Okay, so we thank you very much everyone and we can get half an hour of our life back then. Warren, did you want to say anything? Uh, yeah. To unmute. Oh, just forgot to mute. Something, something with the buttons. Ah. So bye bye. And much thanks to Florence for all of the no, um, minutes, notes, those things. Wow, I can no longer speak. <laughs>